highlighting that question, Alexa. This is the question of Methodism, of how do we return to the Lord, of how do we find God's holiness, and how do we live that out? And so last week, we were at the very, very beginnings at Oxford when um, Wesley was still under 30, and his brother Charles had joined them, and they had grown from a group of four or five um, to 40 plus, and how that group was um, of age anywhere from 14-year-olds to 30-year-olds that brought that first revolution of coming together, waking up between four or five in the morning to study scripture in the Greek that it was written in the New Testament and the classics um, and divinity, and then to also visit prisons and other acts of service with the orphans, um, with the elderly, and with the poor. Well, we're going to skip over a lot that happens, and then, and this is really hard for me because there's so many good stories we're skipping over, um, but Wesley has been um, to Georgia, to the colonies, and back. That was a terrible trip. We can talk about that later. Um, he's also been to Germany um, to study with the Moravians and how he saw their faith um, at play during one of the storms on the um, trips to Georgia, and and now it, the clubs aren't just at Oxford um, at the college. Now there are groups in Oxford, in London, in Bristol. There's this fellow named George Whitfield that you might know that's on the scene and doing some fiery preaching. Um, and the awakening is beginning. And so we're going to zero in um, on uh, 1743 and what happened in Newcastle. Um, an area that Wesley was at in one of his circuits um, and looking to set up a, a new group and a new society there. And as he was there, he began singing the doxology as a way to start inviting people. And it says that three or four curious people came out. And then that three or four became four to five hundred. And that four to five hundred became twelve hundred to fifteen hundred as he was giving a sermon and then saying he would preach it again again later because he knew half of them couldn't even have heard him, even though it says in his journal his voice was strong and clear. And so we have this gathering happening. And within the year at Newcastle, um, they have built, they've gone through a building campaign and they've bought a house, um, the orphan house, and have used it as a preaching house there in that community, but then also as um, a school and infirmary. So this is great moment for today to have the bowls that we did last week and our mission, right, moment of doing acts of service just as the Holiness Club was gathered. And then um, at the same preaching house that they would of a sacrament and preaching, there would also then be service happening and taking care of the community. And so we celebrate that moment through Vincent St. Paul and all that um, the bulls will be able um, to do and provide um, here in our community as well. So then it's a building, right? Buildings always come with extra things. Can I get some nods from the trustees? And more money is always needed. And so John Wesley has to go on the circuit to raise some money to take care of this new building. And he comes back and he finds his followers not doing well um, in sense of sticking to this holiness code um, that, that he and the holiness club, the Bible moths, the Methodists, have introduced. And so he goes through, um, and he puts away above 50 persons. Um, he has them leave uh, the society and he makes a list of why in his journal. Two, for cursing and swearing. Two, for habitual Sabbath breaking. 17, for drunkenness. Two, for retailing spiritous liquors. Three, for quarreling and brawling. One, for beating his wife. Three, for habitual willful lying. Four, for railing and evil speaking. One, for idleness and laziness. And 29, for lightness and carelessness. And then, after seeing this, 
he writes the three general rules and brings them to all of his societies. And these are the three general rules that Methodism is still based on today. And the first general rule is to do no harm. And he um, gives lots of examples, see if you can hear anything that relates to Newcastle. Um, by doing no harm, by avoiding evil of every kind, especially that which is most generally practiced, such as the taking of the name of God in vain, profaning the day of the Lord, either by doing ordinary work or buying and selling, buying or selling spiritist liquors or drinking them, unless in cases of extreme necessity, slaveholding, buying or selling slaves, fighting, quarreling, brawling, brother going to law with brother, returning evil for evil, railing for railing, the using many words in buying or selling, buying or selling goods that have not paid the duty, giving or taking things on usury, unlawful interest, uncharitable or unprofitable conversation, particularly speaking evil of magistrates or of ministers. <laughs> Doing to others as we would not they should do unto us. Doing what we know is not for the glory of God, such as the putting on of gold and costly apparel. I have no wedding ring on right now. Um, the taking such diversions as cannot be used in the name of the Lord Jesus. Singing those songs or reading those books which do not tend to the knowledge or love of God. Softness and needless self-indulgence. Let's forget about that Smith Island cake again. Um, laying up treasure upon earth, borrowing without a probability of paying. Um, David Ramsey would also have something to say about that. Or taking up goods without probability of paying for them. And so part of the thing about these societies is that they would welcome anyone who wanted to flee from the wrath to come to join them. But in order to continue in them, you were expected to show evidence of your desire of salvation in these general rules and in putting them into life and into practice. And, and so for this group of folks, um, in order to join was one thing to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to want that salvation, but in order to stay on the membership rolls was an entirely different thing of were you actually actively working out your salvation and pursuing that holiness. And the second gener general rule is to do good. And so the first one is to do no harm, right? Because if we do harm, nobody's going to remember or know anything different. We are hardwired to no harm. I was just talking with Kim, and she was sharing the statistic that her friend had researched, that it takes 17 good things to happen to rewrite the one bad thing that has happened to us. Because that's our survival. That's our you know, biological way of remembering what's harmful for us. But when it comes to relationships, that gets, that gets tricky. And so the very first rule is to be aware of how we are doing harm and to not do harm. And then from that space, we can move to doing good. Being in every kind merciful after their power as they have opportunity, doing good of every possible sort and as far as possible to all men and women, you do have to do good to us too to their bodies of the ability which God gives, by giving food to the hungry, by clothing the naked, by visiting or helping them that are sick or in prison. Does this sound like Malachi 3 at all? That was the basis um, for this that John Wesley used. To their souls, by instructing, reproving, or exhorting all we have any intercourse with, trampling underfoot that enthusiastic doctrine that we are not to do good unless our hearts be free to it. And that's a whole nother theological discussion that was going on the day that we can get into over Chile, if you like. Um, by doing good, especially to them that are of the household of faith or groaning so to be, employing them preferably to others, buying one of another, helping each other in business, um, so as the more because the world will love its own by them only. Um, by all possible diligence and frugality that the gospel not be blamed by running with patience the race which is set before them, denying themselves and taking up their cross daily, submitting to bear the reproach of Christ, as to be as the filth and offscouring of the world, and looking that men should say all manner of evil of them falsely. So I just want to pause there. 
um, the fact that our ancestors were so bent on being a countercultural witness in the world, we have seen since the very founding of our name, right? We are Methodists because of the mocking that the Oxford Holiness Club received. It could have been Bible mocks. Um, but that mocking continued to grow um, and become more and more dangerous as the uh, movement continued to grow. Just before um, this moment at Newcastle where these general rules come from, there was a mob um, that came around Wesley on one rainy day um, and beat him and drug him through the city by the hair. At times, there were advertisements posted in the London Evening Post that talked about the violence being done to the Methodists. Homes were destroyed um, as the violence that, was, that the Methodists were doing. Um, and so there were, there were issues that complicated things and made this way difficult. And John Wesley is calling not in a bubble, but in a very real and a very dangerous life context, to still do good, to still pursue holiness, and realize that the only way we could do that um, is through the means of grace, is through God's grace and God's love within us. So how shall we return to the Lord? In the wondrous love that is ours in Christ who is our high priest, who is our interceder, who makes a way for us when we see no way. And that is the practice of Lent and the practice of the holiness pursuit of our denomination. To practice prayer, coming to worship, receiving the sacrament, attending to the word, searching the scriptures, all of those ways that we can give the Holy Spirit more and more room to access us and to work in us, with us, through us, and unfortunately, sometimes in spite of us. One of John Wesley's greatest concerns was us becoming a dead sect, of us having the form of church and pursuit of discipleship without any of the power without any of the life, without any of the transformation. Um, also, I'd just like you to know how good you have sermons. This is John Wesley's sermon on the means of grace. Oh, it's still going. It's still going. And I skipped a page. Okay, just saying. And I'm just going to read. All right, I'm trying to play. I'm just going to read one piece of Wesley's concern. Yet once more, we allow, though it is a melancholy truth, that a large proportion of those who are called Christians do to this day abuse the means of grace to the destruction of their souls. This is doubtless the case with all who rest content in the form of godliness without the power. Either they fondly presume they are Christians already because they do thus and thus, although Christ was never yet revealed in their hearts, nor the love of God shed abroad therein and goes on in true Wesleyan and Pauline fashion to um, say a lot more. But that is the essence of Wesley's concern, of how we know that we want to flee from the wrath to come, or our baptismal vows, how we know that we want um, to say no to the powers of evil and the spiritual forces of wickedness in this world, um, but that we have a lot of trouble living lives that are all about that and that do avoid that temptation. And lest you think that Wesley um, was so legalistic that he would um, kick anyone out for anything, I just want you to know that there is mercy in our denomination and grace in this means of grace in the midst of this um, very disciplined and methodical pursuit of holiness and that one of his band leaders wrote him to tell him about the trouble he was having of buying and selling um, and use milk as an example because the cows had to be milked. The milk had to be gotten to the children who were hungry and it wouldn't keep from Sunday to Monday. And John Wesley's response was quite right. Um, so may we, as we come together, find a way to practice both righteousness and mercy to hold one another accountable to a pursuit of holiness that isn't just in form, 
or the shape of it, but has the content and the power of it. And may we also know that we're human and that life is difficult and to give each other space and mercy when we're not able to live into the fullness of who God created us to be. And as we balance that righteousness and mercy together, may we also find a way to do that. Understanding in a context that we are both those who are harmed and those who do the harming. And that one experience doesn't let the other off the hook. There were mobs that were making it physically dangerous for Methodists, but that didn't stop John Wesley from holding them accountable to this pursuit of holiness. Just because harm had been done to them didn't mean that then they were not, it was okay for them not to practice doing good to others. But then there's the opposite side of that, right, too? Of knowing when we have been the ones who have been doing the harm and to find grace and repentance for that, but also to not feel so guilty about that that, that we leave off any pursuit as well. So we come with a full spectrum of harm and of healing, of righteousness and of mercy. And we combine those together at the table. For it is the bread that is broken for us in remembrance of all of the places.